Hey, what is up guys? It is Orbin Hardware. And in today's video, we're gonna build this monster Ryzen gaming PC build featuring this Ansel XDKs and an RX 6800 Big Navi graphics card. Now, as always, we're gonna go over the whole building process step by step from start to finish. And we're then going to fire up the PC and we're going to look at what kind of FPS and frame rate you can expect in case you decide to build this PC. Now, as always, if you find anything you like, all items are yeah, linked up down below. Now, if you're spending about $1,300 on your PC, expecting a monster that can run any game at 4K resolution only makes sense. And sure enough, with this PC build, you'll be able to run most games at 4K with respectable frame rate. But yeah, 1440p gaming will run just amazing on this machine. Now inside this PC, we find a high clock Ryzen 5000 processor that runs neck and neck with Intel's TP Top 10 900K processor, but yeah, at half the price. And for RAM, we're gonna pair the brand new 6 core Ryzen with 16GB of RAM from Cores Air. And for the rest of the system, we find a 1TB SSD, a big Navi graphics card, all contained in this awesome looking NZX TH510i case. Anyway, timestamps can be found down below. Before we get started, drop a comment and let me know what you thought about this video. Drop a like if you enjoy the content and make sure to subscribe to never miss an episode. So let's get started with our motherboard coming in at $115. This is the MSI B450 Tomahawk. Now while opting for AMD's all new B550 motherboards with support for upcoming CPU releases is an option, ATX based 550 chipsets are unfortunately quite expensive. Therefore I ended up picking the Tomahawk B450 coming in at just over $100. Tomahawk Max comes with pretty much all the bells and whistles such as 6 fan headers, great VRMs, USB 3.1 Type-C, as well as an M.2 and he even supports future Ryzen processors through an update that just been released and I'm going to show you guys the update process step by step a little bit further into the video. Now for CPU, we're gonna go with AMD's brand new 5th gen and Zen 3 based Ryzen 5 5600X. Now this gaming optimized 6 core and 12 thread CPU is, yeah, the fastest best budget gaming processor on the market right now, with performance that beats even Intel's highest end and most expensive processors out there. And if we take a quick look at some benchmark, we see that the 5600X is actually neck and neck with both the much more expensive 10 core 10 900k and he even beats in those latest 10 gen 10 700k in death stranding and in gears 5 the 10 900k actually gets beaten by a few fps and in metro exodus the 300 5600x is yeah, as can be seen, dominating the CPU field. Anyway, the Ryzen 5 5600X has a base clock at 3.7 and 4.6 GHz boost clock. So let's install the processor, which is actually very easy. First up, you want to locate the golden triangle, and this lines up with the triangle on our motherboard socket. Simply turn the CPU so that the triangles match up. You want to open the metal arm. Drop the processor into the socket, put the metal arm down, and our CPU is installed. Now the CPU cooler I picked for today's build is the cooler that comes with our CPU. And while this heatsink doesn't offer the best thermals and isn't the most quiet cooler available, it is still perfectly good enough for gaming in a case with a couple of case fans. And here's what the system sound like running Cyberpunk 2077 uncapped at 1080p maxed out.
Now the cooler installment is pretty simple. Now, as we can see a motherboard comes with a retention frame pre-installed, but yeah, since we're using a cooler with springs, we need to remove the retention frame from the motherboard. Using a Phillips screwdriver, we can remove the four screws. And if this is the first time installing the uh, included stock CPU cooler, the cooler already has some thermal grease pre-applied, and in that case, you don't need to apply thermal grease on the CPU lid first. Gently position the CPU cooler of the CPU so that the four spring screws on the heatsink align with the four screw holes on the back plate. And using a screwdriver, turn each spring screw half a turn clockwise to ensure that the spring screw makes a connection with the back plate. Follow a diagonal pattern across the CPU cooler, further tightening its spring screw with the full turn. And with all four spring screws connected to the back plate, tighten them until you feel resistance. Then you want to check the CPU cooler to ensure that it's properly secured to the motherboard. Lastly guys, don't forget to connect the fan power cable on the CPU cooler to the fan, uh, CPU fan header on the motherboard. Now we're almost done with the main board, the only thing missing is RAMs and for today's build I ended up picking the Vengeance LPX from Corsair. Now this is a top of the line and highly popular 16GB kit that I've been using for many of my past PC builds and I've never come across a single blue screen using this particular kit. 16GB is actually more than enough for modern gaming. Pull back the clips for the second and the fourth dim slot and simply plug them in just like so. Very easy right and now we can take the motherboard assembly if you like and install it in our chassis. And for today's build we're gonna go with the NZXDH510i coming in at $99. The NZXDH510i is a budget oriented chassis that uses a metal exterior complemented with a tempered glass side panel and the case comes with a unique bracket solution for mounting a radiator in the front. Now for cooling we find uh, two 120mm pre-installed fans, we got one in the top and another one in the back and the fans are hooked up to a smart hub that lets you control up to three fans. Now these can be controlled inside a software called CAM. The H510i also comes with two LED strip pre-applied and these can be customized to your liking inside the same software. Strolling around in Cyberpunk for about half an hour at 1080p ultra settings, the system is averaging between 79 to 80c on the CPU, but these are perfectly fine numbers according to AMD using the stock cooler. So let's install a motherboard and in order to get access to the inside of our chassis, there is a thumb screw we need to untie that holds the temper glass in place. And with the CPU cooler already installed, we can grab onto the CPU cooler and slide the motherboard into place. And yeah, this can be done either by having the case standing up or having it laying down. And we secure the motherboard using the screws that comes provided from Anset XT. And with the motherboard installed and secured before we install our power supply, grab a card in storage. Now is actually a good time to connect the chassis cables that takes care of the front audio, USB, as well as the power button. Let's start with USB 3. This is a white connector, it is fairly thick and it's almost impossible to miss. Simply route it through one of the various routing holes and plug it in just like so. The connector is located down at the bottom of the motherboard. Next up we got front audio. This cable goes to the left side corner. Lastly before we're done, there is a front panel connector you need to connect as well and you find these on the lower right side. Also guys I need to mention the fact that the H510i also comes with a USB Type-C port on the front but yeah the motherboard is lacking this internal connection so if you want a motherboard that supports this there is a motherboard linked up down below that supports this port as well. Moving on to power supply, we're gonna use the Corsair CX650M 650 watt unit and this is a high quality power supply with 80 plus bronze efficiency with CMI modular cables. Now 650 watt is actually more than enough for this PC build but something to have in mind is that a CMI modular PSU isn't really a requirement here and so if you wanna shred off a few dollars here, I got a few uh, additional options linked up down below. You want to make sure that you got the fan facing downwards, then gently slide the PSU in place and secure it. 
There are a couple of cables we're gonna need here. First up, we got the 24 pin power for the motherboard. And this one goes to the connector on the right side. Next up, we got the 8 pin power for our CPU. And this one goes all the way up to the top left side corner. Now it is time to install a SSD and for this build I ended up picking the Kingston A400 with 960GB of storage. And I've been using Kingston for many of my PC builds now and they never, never fail to disappoint. They always seem to hit that, you know, price and performance curve with their SSDs and I'm actually feeling very confident recommending them in many of my PC builds. A mechanical spinning hard drive is also an option here, however, while that will give you more storage per dollar, your system will feel a lot slower and less snappy versus a flash based SSD. Also keep in mind, you can always upgrade and add more storage later down the road, as the case has plenty of room to fit up to two mechanical hard drives. And another SSD can also be installed in the case as well. And on top of that, there is also an option to install an M.2 unit using the M.2 slot on the motherboard. Don't forget to plug in the SATA cable that comes with our MSI motherboard, as well as the SATA power connector coming from our power supply. Route the SATA cable through one of the various routing holes and plug it into the motherboard. It is time to install a graphics card and for today's build we're gonna use AMD's brand new Radeon RX 6800 Big Navi graphics card coming in at $579. Based on the RDNA2 architecture, the 6800 offers stellar 4K gaming performance and in some cases the card is actually on par with the much more expensive RTX 3080 and thanks to 16GB of VRAM, you will never run out of video memory. So let's install our graphics card and we need to remove two of these upper PCE slots and then we can gently just slide in our graphics card just like so. Then plug in this PCIe cable and our graphics card is installed. And the only thing missing now is the whack on the side panels and it is time to turn on our system and hopefully if you did everything right your system should power on. So let's fire up some games and find out how it performs. But yeah, before we do, let's update our motherboard first. Now this step might be required if you buy a B450 motherboard right now. But let's say you watched this video a few months after it was uploaded. It's a great chance guys, you don't even have to do this step. Now to double check if the update is necessary, if you're only seeing a black screen upon startup, an update will be necessary. Now updating is super easy and all you need is a USB stick and an internet connection to download the latest available BIOS from MSI. Link to where you can find this BIOS update can be found down below. Once downloaded make sure to rename the file to msi.rom. Put the file on the USB stick then you wanna plug the USB into the BIOS flashback port and then press the flash button and a red LED will start flashing for a few minutes. Eventually your PC will restart and you will see this screen which indicate that our update is completed. Now you want to jump into BIOS and you want to head over to OC on the left side then you want to scroll all the way down to something called Extreme Memory Profile XMP and you want to select Profile 1. This will activate the RAMs to run in its advertised speed for optimal performance. Press escape and save all the settings. Godfall is first and looking at the numbers the RX 6800 shows RTX 3080 level performance as can be seen. Very impressive results and compared to the RTX 3070 the big Navi GPU is actually about 18-19% to 19 faster. Jumping over to 4K resolution the 6800 is losing a bit of ground here but it is still over 10% faster than the RTX 3070 and about 15% slower than the RTX 3080. Next up is Assassin's Creed Valhalla where RDNA 2 has actually proven to be very competitive versus Nvidia's Ampere. Looking at the numbers we see that the $580 6800 actually beats Nvidia's $700 3080 again. The 6800 is almost 30% faster than the RTX 3070 at 1440p. And bumping the resolution to 4K, the 6800 once again loses a bit of ground versus the competition, as can be seen. 
Moving on to Death Stranding at 1440p, we see that the RX 6800 is about 5% slower than the 3080 and it is quite a bit faster than the RTX 3070. Now at 4K resolution, the $700 RTX 3080 once again pulls ahead a bit. However, versus the RTX 3070, the 6800 shows good form with more than 10% performance advantage. Battlefield 5 running at ultra settings at 1080p. As we can see, the 6800 is only a few APS lower than the much more expensive RTX 3080. However, as we can see, we see a fairly low 1% lows for the 6800. This might be driver related issues and might get fixed later down the road. At 1080p, the $499 RTX 3070 is about 17% slower than the 6800. But yeah, it is also $80 cheaper. Now at 1440p, the gap between the 6800 and the 3070 grows to 23% as we're getting more GPU bound. And at 4K, we see that the 6800 is about 19% faster than the 3070 and 16% slower than the 3080. Moving on to control where the 6800 once again shows respectable frame rate. And as we can see, it is sitting safely between uh, the 3080. 70 and the 3080. Gears 5 is up next where we once again find the 6800 right between the 3070 and the 3080 regardless of resolution. Ghost Recon Breakpoint is next and here we're running the game at ultra settings using the Vulcan API where the 6800 shows healthy numbers even at 4K resolution and with 16GB of GDDR6 memory you don't have to worry about running out of video memory. Red Dead Redemption 2 is not a game running on Vulcan, but in this game the distance to the 3070 is much smaller with only a few FPS difference at 4K, where the 6800 for the first time has a hard time reaching that magic 60 FPS mark. However, both Metro Exodus and Division 2 runs great on the 6800 even at 4K, which tells us that for the most part you're able to run your favorite game at 4K maxed out while still averaging 60 FPS. Yeah, that is just insane price to performance. Before we conclude the benchmark guys, let's quickly have a look at Ray Tracing 2. And if you have been following the rumors around Big Navi, there has been quite a few rumors suggesting that AMD was gonna be a bit behind Nvidia here. And that does seem to be the case. And as we can see, running Battlefield 5 regardless of resolution, the 6800 is about 20 to 22% slower than the 3070. This seems to be true for Metro Exodus as well. And so what we can say so far is that AMD is falling a bit behind Nvidia when it comes to ray tracing. And so if that is important to you, as of the time being, you should pick the green team. But yeah, if you rather pick the best overall performing graphics card for its price tag and don't really care about ray tracing, the 6800 offers unbeatable price to performance at $579. All PC components we just looked at can be found down below. I'm starting up a Discord server guys and it would be fantastic if you guys wanted to join. And here you can discuss PC builds and issues and pretty much everything in between. So I'm going to hang out there and answer any questions you guys might have. So you definitely want to join at the Discord server. Link to the Discord can be found down below. Now watch either of these two videos and I will see you guys in the next video.